Good morning, everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center, the ADRC. The ADRC is a project of the Area Agency on Aging, and I'm a contractor under both of those programs uh, with the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Um, we're thrilled again to have um, Francis Espinoza and Camille Brown here from the uh, Fair, Fair Housing Center of North Texas to talk about um, tenants' rights. And we're trying, we put this on um, as we did our March um, series last month. We had several comments in the um, in the uh, responses we got from you for you doing your evaluation that people would have liked more information on both of these topics. So we, um, we expanded this to an hour and a half version and um, hope to give you some more information today um, to add to that. Um, I do wanna say, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, we, we, we have an upcoming clinic that we're um, registering for and the clinic is gonna be different than this format. The clinic we've got, we're, we're holding to a small number of people and we're doing it on a on an interactive format. We'll be doing it in a Zoom meeting format. So you will have a microphone in that and you will have a, um, you, you will be on, um, on camera just like everybody else. And we're asking you to bring preferably your real life um, eviction um, issues or, or prevention um, questions that you have. And, um, and so I encourage you to look at that and, and encourage people to sign up for that. We're holding that to a limited number of people. Um, I think we have 10 spots left for that, but I really encourage you. I, I want to explain it because it is a very different format. We have not done one of these before. And so I wanted to explain that, that that's not going to be a webinar. Um, we will not be uh, putting out the recording to that just because we want people to be comfortable to bring what they, to, um, their um, cases to the table without that information getting out to the world with it just staying within the group. And we'll be asking for people to understand confidentiality as we, as, as, as we get started with that. So please uh, um, know that's coming, it's coming next week. So if you're interested or know somebody that's interested, please um, sign up for that. If we can advance to the next slide, Real quick, I want to talk about CEUs. Uh, we're offering complimentary CEUs today for licensed um, professional counselors and licensed social workers in the state of Texas. We're also offering a, a certificate of attendance. Uh, both the, the, the requirements for both of those would be the same. If you're a licensed social worker and licensed LPC outside of Texas, I've had people tell me that some jurisdictions accept them. There is no guarantee we're, we're set up in Texas, but you're more than welcome to go through the process and get it and submit it to whatever your agency is that is in your, your jurisdiction. It'll be one and a half classroom hours. You must complete the entire webinar live. Um, you can't miss more than about five, 10 minutes at the most of the webinar. And we get that information from a report from Zoom once we close out. You must also complete the Google survey evaluation form. It should pop up as you're closing out of Zoom today. In some cases, it won't pop up because primarily some companies have pop-up blockers in place that prevent that type of thing from, from um, popping up. But you will receive it in a follow-up email that I will be sending out most likely tomorrow morning. Um, and so make sure you complete that. You'll have one week to complete that. And then give me two weeks after that. Usually I ask for a week. This time I'm asking for two weeks uh, till, till, till the 11th to get those certificates to you. And I, the reason for that is I'm going to be out of town for 10 days. And, that's a, and doing the certificates is very difficult to do on the road. It's much easier to do when I'm here at the office. So I'm, I'm asking for two weeks uh, to get those certificates out after the closing of the, um, of the evaluation on the, set, on the 27th. And Francis, I'm going to turn it over to you. And, um, and let you have it. Okay, thank you, Marty. So I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. If not, put in the chat that I need to talk louder. Um, my name is Frances Espinosa and I'm the Executive Director of the North Texas Fair Housing Center. Um, and I'll let my staff person introduce herself. Oh, my name is 
Camille Brown, and I'm Director of Advocacy and Education at the North Texas Fair Housing Center, and I will be hanging in the background today just watching uh, the chat to capture y'all's questions as they come in, so feel free to do that. So we're going to talk about tenants' rights today. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is leases, um, because I want everyone to make sure they know that a lease document is a contract. Um, so it's legally binding, um, and it usually is for a term. Typically, it's 12 months, but it can range anywhere from six months to 18 months. Um, and typically, if you have questions about something that's happening, at your apartment or at your rental, um, the best thing to do is go back to that lease document because in there you'll find terms like you'll find descriptions of late fees. Uh, they'll tell you about utility charges in there. They'll tell you what happens if you don't pay your rent. Um, there'll be information about eviction and then fees and penalties will be listed for breaking your lease. Um, so it's really important to understand all those terms before you sign a lease and to understand that you are agreeing to stay at your rental for the time of the lease. Um, so one thing that we get a lot of calls about is folks who go visit a rental property and it might be, for example, uh, dirty or it might need to be painted or maybe the carpet looks um, like it needs to be replaced and the housing provider will promise that all of that's going to get done before the person moves in. Um, so they go ahead and sign the lease and then, you know, move-in day comes along and they get to the apartment or the rental and they realize that none of that's been done. So um, really want to make sure people understand, you know, don't sign a lease on the promise that the housing provider is going to do something make sure that the rental is in the state that you want to rent it in. So, um, you know, don't get stuck in a situation where you, once you've signed that lease document, you gotta move in or pay the penalty for not moving in or for breaking the lease, even if it isn't up to the standard that you were promised. Um, so if you do break a lease without paying the penalty that's in the lease, um, the apartment or the rental could, the housing provider could pursue you for unpaid rent. Um, they could sue you in court or they could report you to credit agencies that you um, left a debt unpaid. Um, so, you know, need to be really mindful of that. Um, and there is an advantage for renters with a lease, um, which is you lock in your rental, your monthly rent amount. Um, which is really important right now because rents seem to be going a little bit haywire in that um, we've been getting calls from people who are getting upwards of like $500 rent increases when their lease is up for renewal um, because the market is really competitive right now um, and housing providers think they can get a lot more for their rental units. Um, so if you're not in a lease, um, so the lease locks in your rent amount, and if you're not in a lease, for example, once your lease ends, um, you may be offered some options. You might be offered um, sign another lease at this amount or go month to month at another amount. And most times the month to month rental amount is gonna be higher because you're paying for the privilege of being able to break or being able to move out with you know 30 day notice, for example. Um, you're not locked into 12 months or six months or whatever. Um, but understand that what happens when you go month to month is since you haven't locked in with a lease agreement, a specific rental amount, the housing provider could increase your rent by giving you a 30 day notice anytime. And so you could get your rent increased three times in a 12 month period and that would not be illegal as long as the housing provider gives you at least 30 day notice of the increased rent amount. So a lease does protect tenants in that sense of locking in a monthly rent amount. Um, so when you get to the end of your lease, uh, the housing provider does have 
the right to tell you they're not going to renew the lease and they don't even need to give you a reason they can just say we're not renewing your lease um, inside your lease document there'll be a there'll be a description or details of what notice the housing provider has to give you in order to um, not renew the lease. So typically that's at least 60 days before the lease ends and they'll let you know at that point we're not going to renew. Um, or like I said, they'll give you options of here's a renewal amount. You could go month to month. Here's that amount that you'd have to pay per month for rent. Um, so uh, the decision to renew, they don't even have to tell you why they're not renewing, um, but the decision cannot be based on discrimination. Um, so one exception to the lease non-renewal and um, housing providers not having to give you a reason is if you live in affordable housing, tax credit housing, for example, or subsidized housing, um, that's a, a there are only certain reasons that they can decide not to renew your lease. So it's not as open as it is with regular market rate housing. And Francis, we have a question in the chat. Okay. It says, do they have to notify you of increase for the month to month? Yes. If they don't give you a notice that the month to month rate is going to increase, then you can assume that the rent is going to be the same amount as is in your lease. Um, and then if they give you a notice that it's going to increase, they have to give you at least 30 days for that to become effective, which means if they give it to you late, like say they give it to you right now, like say today you get a notice that your rent's going to be increased because you're going month to month uh, starting May 1st, you actually have to have 30 days notice. So technically they can't impose that rent increase until the June 1st rent because 30 days won't have passed when you owe May 1st rent. And Francis, could you speak a little bit more about month to month leases as far as, you know, are you expected to sign a new lease every month? Um, just can you kind of explain what people can expect when moving to a month to month lease as far as um, rent amounts and, and how things may change. Mm -hmm. So um, when you get to the end of your lease term, typically the housing provider will offer you another, say for example, 12 month lease, if that's what you uh, just had, or they may offer you, and this isn't always an option. Some apartments, some rentals will not offer a month to month option, but some do, they'll say, okay, if you renew your lease, for 12 months, you'll pay, I don't know, uh, $1,500 a month in rent. But if you want to go month to month, it's going to be $1,650 a month. And so, you know, you're paying $150 premium to have that month to month, which means having a month to month lease, you can get out of it any time. You, you don't sign a document for that month to month. It's just, that's just, it is what it is. It's a month to month uh, agreement. And at any time, you could give a 30-day notice or a 60-day notice that, hey, I'm going to move out. And you're not bound to anything because um, you don't have a set term in place. So if you end up going month to month, though, a lot of the provisions of the lease that you just ended um, still will hold. So for example, if that old lease document had a fee in it for a late payment of rent, that would still hold. So you would still have to follow that rule unless you were given another notice that, okay, we used to charge $50 late fee. Now we're going to charge 75, but they would have to notify you of that. So essentially all the other terms in the lease are still, they're still going to hold. You're just going month to month on the rental payment and you can end your rental. You can end that at any time by giving a notice of 30 days to move out. I hope that makes sense. Is there any follow-up questions, Camille? No. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about fees and deposits. So, um, and a lot of times these are given different names by different housing providers. 
Um, so um, typically application fee, that's going to be the same all the time or called the same name in application fee. So this is a fee that an apartment's going to charge you to do a screening, typically of your credit background. Um, and sometimes in addition, it will check criminal background. Um, so once you've paid these fees, it doesn't matter whether you're accepted or reject, your application is accepted or rejected, the housing provider does not have to return these fees. So if you pay, you know, it's a, sometimes we'll see something like, you know, $35 a rental application fee or $50 if it's a couple, for example. Um, once you pay those fees, that's it. You've paid for those screenings, so you're not ever going to get that money back, even if they come back to you and say, you didn't get approved to rent here. Um, so now there's also an application deposit. Now that's different because that is a fee that you will pay to hold an apartment for you. So for example, um, say you go today to an apartment, uh, you pay the application fee, you get screened and they approve you to rent there. Um, and you tell them, well, you know, I don't want to move in until the 15th of May. And so they might, they will tell you if that's okay or not. And if it is, they might charge you an application deposit or a holding fee so that they can keep that apartment for you until you move in on May 15th. So from now until May 15th, you're holding that apartment, but you're not gonna have to pay rent. Typically, whatever you pay as an application deposit or a holding fee, they will credit your first month's rent that amount. So you're not gonna lose that if you decide to, you know, if you move, go through with it and move in. Now, if you decide that you don't wanna move in, between now and May 15th, the housing provider does not have to return that deposit, okay, because they were holding the apartment and didn't look for any other people to rent that apartment because you said you were going to move in and then you changed your mind. So they don't have to return that deposit. They can keep it, okay. Um, say, for example, uh, you pay your application fee and on the same day, you also give that deposit, application deposit or holding fee. Um, but then, because it takes them a day or two or three to run your credit history and your criminal background check. And then they call you a few days later and say, I'm sorry, you didn't qualify for that unit. We're not gonna rent to you. They have to at that, since they rejected you as an applicant, any deposit that you paid to hold that apartment, they have to give back to you because they decided they don't want to rent to you. Okay, so if they decide they don't want you or they reject your application and you've already paid the holding fee, you're, you need to, you're supposed to get that back. But if you decide, if you're approved and then you decide, you know what, I changed my mind, I don't want to rent here anymore, um, you could lose that deposit and that's completely legal for them to keep that because their justification will be well, we held that apartment off the market for you and didn't advertise it or didn't try to find anyone else to rent it. So you have to pay us for that lost time. Um, and, then, and then there's also a security deposit. So those are fees you pay when you move in um, that the, apart, the rental will hold and they could use at the end of your lease term when you move out, they could use that deposit to cover any unpaid rent or cleaning fees or any damage to the apartment. Um, and so security deposit and what is one of those things where, um, you know, depending on how you left the apartment, you may or may not get that security deposit back. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those security deposits because we get a lot of questions about that as well. Um, so if you hope to get your security deposit back, um, there's some things that you need to make sure that you do. Um, and that is to give the proper notice before you move out. So um, look back at your lease and see if it requires you to give a 60 day notice or a 30 day notice to move. So if you're in a 12 month lease, for example, um, and it says if, 
if you don't want to renew this lease, you need to give us a 60 day notice that you're moving out. That means two months before your lease expires, you need to notify the housing provider, hey, I'm going to move out. I'm giving you my notice. I'm going to move out. Now, when I say notify them, always do so in writing. Write up your, a letter, keep a copy for yourself with your notice so that you can prove that you gave the notice when you were supposed to. So if you give that notice late, you still have to give the amount of notice in the lease. So if you give it like 15 days before your lease expires, you still have to give 60 days notice, which means you're gonna have to stay in that apartment another two months after your lease expires because you didn't you need to make sure you give the 60 day notice per what your lease says um, and i use 60 days because that is more common now than 30 days notice but check your lease document for what that term is okay so you need to do that you need to make sure that you don't owe any money when you move out and that means you know you're paid up in your rent if you had any late fees on the books you're paid up with those and also that you're current with utilities if the housing provider is the one that bills you for utilities. Um, you need to make sure that you leave the rental in clean and in good condition. And you have to provide them with a forwarding, addre forwarding address for where you want your security deposit um, returned to you. Okay, so what are the landlord's obligations? So within 30 days of your move out date, the housing provider needs to give you um, an itemization of what they used your security deposit for or return your security deposit or a combination of the two within 30 days of your move out. So say your uh, security deposit was $150 and they say, well, you know, we used $100 for cleaning and they send you a check back for $50 they could do that. Or they can send you just the itemization to say, you know what, you had a security deposit $150 and this is, you're not getting anything back because these are the things we used it for. Um, or they might just send you the check if your department looks great and you didn't owe them any money, they might send you the check back for the $150. Um, so ideally, or in theory, what they're only supposed to charge you for is anything beyond normal wear and tear. So, you know, if you cut holes out of the carpet or your dog, you know, pulled up pieces of the carpet or your cat scratched, you know, clawed the, clawed the carpet to death in one area and it's bald. Those are things that are beyond normal wear and tear and they would use their security deposit for that or any holes in the wall or things like that. Um, and just a few questions from the chat. Okay. With an admin fee. Is that expected to be returned to the applicant? Um, it depends on what the admin fee is for. Um, so sometimes, you know, depending on what they're collecting the admin fee for, if it is used for, you know, administrative work that they're doing to process your application, you're not going to get that back. Um, but if they're, you know, using the admin fee term for, you know, something like a holding deposit, then that would follow the guidelines for the application deposit or the holding deposit. So it really depends on what they're, um, how they're defining administrative fee. Um, I think most typically though, they're saying that that's their, for their time to process your application. So in most cases, you're not gonna get that back. Okay, and is carpet condition a part of normal wear and tear? You know, um, carpet is one of those gray areas where um, they could charge you to replace it, they could charge you to clean it, and there real there is no law in Texas that will help us determine what is um, what is beyond normal wear and tear for a carpet and when a carpet should be replaced. Just you know, in an, in the normal course of business versus when a tenant was so rough on the carpet that the tenant's the only reason that the carpet needs to be replaced. So um, what we recommend is that when you move in, you take pictures of everything. And when you are, after you clean the apartment and have moved all your belongings, 
take more pictures of the apartment as you left it so that a comparison can be made as to you know how much um, wear was caused on the carpet or to the apartment generally. Um, so you know carpet's a real gray area. Um, you know sometimes an apartment will have their own policy that you know we um, replace it every five years and between tenants. So even if they replace it every five years, if you stay in an apartment for 10 years, you may not get the carpet replaced. Um, if you go rent an apartment and you stay there for only two years, they might just clean it and have the next tenant move in. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where you really have to look at it case by case. And the best thing for you to do to protect yourself is to take photos of everything, like I said, before you move in and when you move out, so a comparison can be made. And can the landlord, if the apartment is in decent condition, can the landlord still charge for cleaning? Yes, they can still charge you for cleaning. Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, um, typically it's reasonable for them to spend $125 or so to clean the apartment once somebody moves out. So even if you've cleaned it when you move out, um, they could still use some of your deposit to clean it or to say they cleaned it. So, you know, again, it's one of those things where um, pictures are gonna be really important because your only recourse is going to be to, you know, if you feel that they kept your security deposit unfairly, um, you would need to go to a court. You would have to bring the housing provider to court suing them to get your deposit back. And is it a tenant right to request and receive a move out inspection with the management? Um, typically apartments do have a checklist um, that they have you complete when you move in and then you can request a walkthrough when you move out um, and you should get a copy of that same checklist you filled out when you moved in so you can review the apartment with the housing provider. Um, it's not an absolute right, though, in the law that they do a walk through with you when you move out, but you can request one um, and have, go through the apartment with the housing provider. Okay. And we have a couple of other comments that I, a uh, couple of other questions that I think require additional comment. So I'm going to push those to the end of the presentation so that we can keep moving, but there's a comment about subleasing and there's a comment about, I guess, kind of breaking your lease once you qualify for maybe affordable housing. So okay. those are those are two things. So I see those questions, but we're going to move those uh, to the end, but we will address those. We just want to go ahead and keep these things moving. Okay. Yeah. Just remind me at the end, Camille, about those. Sure. Okay. So a little bit more in deposits. Um, so like I said, do move in and move out checklists, take photos um, upon move in and after um, you've moved out and cleaned, do photos, um, have witnesses um, and have proof uh, that your landlord has received no any notices. For example, if during the course of your stay, there was always problems with plumbing, say, um, you know, make sure that you have the, that documentation that you asked for various repairs up to the plumbing, because that could be really important if when you move out, they try to use some of your deposit to fix plumbing. If plumbing had always been a problem and it was something that they were supposed to fix, you want to make sure that you have notices that reflect that. So if they charge you for plumbing repairs when you move out, you will have evidence that you should not have been charged for that. Okay, so like I said, if you feel that your deposit has been kept by the housing provider unfairly, you would have to go to um, what I call small claims court. Um, here in Texas, it's called Justice of the Peace Court, and you would have to file a small claim against your housing provider um, for to get your deposit back. Um, and this is where all your photos and your um, documentation of different repair issues, that is all gonna be really important for your case. Um, and if the housing provider is found to have wrongfully kept your deposit, um, they can, they may have to pay three times, they may have to pay you back three times the amount of the deposit um, uh, 
plus $100 in attorney's fees if you had an attorney help you. Although with Justice of the Peace Court, you can represent yourself and do everything on your own. You don't have to have a lawyer. Um, this is an example of something that you, a document you could give your housing provider if you have not gotten your security deposit back or any itemization of what they used it for. Um, so, you know, you could fill this out and give it to your housing provider, you know, as a kind of, um, kind of a notification before you go to Justice and Peace Court that might work to get your security deposit back. So um, you can always do this first before you file a claim in small claims court. Um, so you could use this form, but you could also just, you know, put something in writing and say, you know, you didn't return my security deposit and I'm requesting that you return my security deposit. It's been over 30 days and I haven't received anything from you. Um, you know, that may work. And if it doesn't, then you can go to small claims court to try to get your deposit back. You want to take the uh, quiz questions, Camille? You want me to? No, I can. I can okay, do that. Cool. Um, but so, but before we, before we go on, there's a few questions from the chat. The first: Are you able to legally break your lease due to nuisance neighbors, things like drug activity, unsafe living conditions, smokers, etc.? Um, you know. Um, I think I'm gonna, I think I have a slide about this later on, but um, the short answer is no. There's only a few reasons in Texas that you can lawfully break your lease. And unfortunately, feeling unsafe is not one of them. Um, and I'll probably, I'll go later in the presentation, I'll go over what those legal reasons are that will allow you to break your lease without any fees or penalties. Um, but typically, you know, even if you're living in an apartment or a rental that's falling in on you due to, you know, dilapidation or, you know, need for repairs, um, that's not a legal reason that you can break your lease, unfortunately. Okay. And next, uh, how can we apply tenants' rights to uh, populations who are in written agreements that pay without written agreements, but they pay cash month to month. So specifically immigrant renters and other and other vulnerable populations, maybe even those with criminal background policies, I mean, uh, that are trying to circumvent, things like that. So are there any rights for those who rent without written agreements, but they pay, but they pay cash month to month? And is there anything you may advise uh, to add a layer of protection for the, for the tenant in those situations? Um. Well, even if you are, even if you're not uh, documented, um, you could still sign a lease. So it's not illegal for somebody who um, is undocumented to sign a lease. So, um, you know, I would say the first thing is to request that lease document because it's going to have, you know, all the terms in there that are going to be, um, that are going <coughs> to protect the tenant. Um, if you don't have a lease agreement in place, the default is to look to Texas law. And, you know, quite honestly, the Texas law does not have many protections for tenants in it. Um, so, um, you know, it's just Texas is a very um, pro land ownership state. And, you know, <clears throat> the apartment lobby here in Texas is very strong. And so there aren't a lot of laws on the books in Texas that are protected of tenants. So, you know, I would say ask for a lease document because regardless of what your documentation status is, you can still sign a lease and lock in those terms. Um, but that being said, you know, if a housing provider is trying to circumvent the law by um, not treating people fairly, if it's a uh, discrimination issue based on race or national origin, for example, that could be a fair housing violation that could be investigated by um, us, the North Texas Fair Housing Center or HUD or um, the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, so, you know, those issues of fairness are 
things that might fall under discrimination law that we could look into. Okay. And there's another question from Irene. If you could maybe reword that, if you want to message me directly and reword that, I'm not quite sure what um, what situation you're, you're referring to. And so there's a couple other questions, but we'll go ahead and get through the, the Q&A. And again, I'll move some of these to the end of the presentation because there's a little bit more discussion required. Okay, so a lot of y'all have already answered this first one, which of the following fees can be returned to the tenant? There may be more than one answer. The application fee, the security deposit, the holding fee, or the amenity fee. And again, it would be the security deposit and the holding fee. So we can go to the next question there. Are you done with that one? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so um, let's talk about repairs because that is another um, question that we get all the time. Um, so what are the landlord's obligations? They need to repair um, anything in the rental um, that's you know, a health issue or a safety issue. Um, and with repair issues, we look at what is a reasonable time for this repair to get made. So you know, typically that would be seven days or five working days to have something repaired, but there are items that are, are things that might be um, more urgent. So, you know, obviously if a pipe bursts, that's gonna be an urgent repair. So that should be done as soon as possible. Um, and so, you know, if for example, though, a toilet isn't working in an apartment and you have two bathrooms, the seven days might be okay in that situation because you have another bathroom to use. If it's your only bathroom and your only toilet that's not working, that's probably gonna be more urgent. And that is gonna be something that needs to re be repaired way before seven days is up. Um, so you have to, for repair issues, you have to look at what the thing is that needs to be repaired um, and what is a reasonable amount of time to request that that be repaired. Um, so always document your repair requests. Um, some places have, some rentals have forms you have to fill out on paper, um, but most departments are moving to portals where you can put your repair request in a online portal. Um, but once you do that, you know, if there's a way that you can print the page or even once you put it in there and submit it, take a screenshot with your phone so you have proof that, of, uh, that you made the request and when you made the request. Um, so the tenant's obligations, um, you always need to be paid up on your rent. Um, and you need to make sure that um, you don't use the repair as an excuse to not pay your rent because there is never a reason. Like I said before, your uh, rental could be falling in on you. You could be like floating in a foot of water. Um, those unfortunately are not reasons why you could stop paying your rent. Um, there is, you know, just I want to, I'll mention this really quickly, but there is a procedure that you can go through um, for withholding your rent or making the repairs yourself and deducting it from your rent, but I don't recommend that you use that. It does exist, but Quite honestly, the threshold for that is so strict, it's so high, and the steps you need to follow are so strict that it's almost impossible to meet them. And then if you stop paying your rent or withhold portions of your rent, your housing provider will give you a notice for unpaid rent and you might be evicted for that. Um, and so, you know, you just need to be really, really careful. Most times in order to have a valid repair and deduct, you have to have something that raises to the level of uh, an issue in your rental that the city, the city's code department or one of the city's inspection departments would go and cite the landlord for that and fine them for that if they don't fix it. Um, and those issues are not, you know, 
uh, cities won't go inspect for most issues. It has to be something like really bad for them to go inspect. So I don't ever recommend to anyone that they stop paying their rent. Um, so um, like I said about the uh, repairs, always document the requ repair requests that you make. Um, so again, you could, you know, there is a process where if repairs aren't made, you could terminate your lease or sue. Um, I don't ever recommend terminating your lease because of a repair issue, because if you have a lease that's for 12 months and you try to terminate it in the middle of the lease because of a repair issue, you're probably going to be given a notice for non-payment of rent and even if you move out in month seven, the housing provider could pursue you for the remainder that you owe on the lease. So this is not, it's just not a good idea to use a repair issue to break your lease or not pay your rent. Um, you can stay living there and you could sue your housing provider um, for any damage that the repairs, the repair issues have caused you. Um, so you could sue for, you know, one month's rent plus $500. You could sue for actual damages, court costs, attorney's fees. Um, and you could also ask the court for a reduction in rent if you paid your rent in full um, for months where the repairs were needed and weren't getting done. But again, you'd want to go through the court process to get that in a judge's order because um, you don't want to make those determinations on your own. Um, because you don't want to be hit with an eviction, for example, or be pursued for unpaid rent. Um, and this is uh, just a sample form of a repair request. But again, you know, these forms are kind of ancient and most rentals now have a portal that they use at least apartment building, large apartment buildings have a portal where you can do repair requests. If you're renting a single family home, you might be renting from uh, someone, the, the, you may be renting directly from the owner. And so a form like this might come in handy because you know somebody who's just renting a few single family homes probably isn't gonna set up their own portal for that. So um, this might come in handy for that. You want to take this one, Camille? Yes. So which of the following is not recommended when requesting repairs? There may be more than one answer. So I'll give y'all some time to put your answers in the chat. But which of the following is not recommended when requesting repairs? A, be current on rent. B, send letter with a traceable form of delivery. C, withhold rent until repairs are made, or D, a notice signed by the tenant. And we're getting a lot of C. Okay, and that is correct. So it's always recommended that you be current on rent, rent requesting repairs. It's a best practice to send a letter with a traceable form of delivery. And a traceable form of delivery just means that uh, the sender gets some sort of notification that the letter was delivered to someone at the appropriate kind of location, right? So there's no, there's no room for letters that get lost in the void or get lost in the mail. These are, these are letters that, or even, you can, even electronic, there's even electronic ways to trace the fact that it's been delivered. C, withhold rent until repairs are made. Obviously that is not recommended. Uh, there is pretty much no case in Texas where you should withhold rent in order to, to get something that you're asking for. It's, it is pretty much always a bad idea here in Texas. Then D, a notice signed by the tenant. Uh, yes, that is obviously recommended um, that, that the actual tenant is, is making a formal request for these particular repairs. And I'm going to address a couple of things from the from the chat we'll talk about um, we'll talk about modifications uh, here later on 
Uh, someone asked about can domestic can victims of domestic violence break a lease? Yes, uh, there are only two legal ways to break a lease. One is uh, for people with a disability, uh, where the where their current unit does not fit their needs, and the second way is if you are a victim of domestic violence, and there are certain steps to take in that situation. But if you find if you encounter someone like that in the course of your work, please refer them to us. Uh, this is something that we that we are starting to do now on a pretty routine basis. Actually, is is handling cases for domestic, uh, victims of domestic violence who need to get out of their lease. So yes, that is one of only two legal ways in Texas to break your lease. And then one more question before we move on. Uh, can you reiterate about renters being able to subtract any repairs from the monthly rent? From what? From the monthly rent, just the repair and deduct. Oh, well, you know, first I want to say again, I don't ever, rec we don't ever recommend doing that because um, unless you have full agreement in writing from the housing provider that it's okay to do that, because maybe you paid for some repair in the apartment and the housing provider agreed with you that you could deduct it from the rent and you have that agreement in writing, we don't ever recommend that you do any kind of deductions for repairs. Um, because again, if you, there are, there is a process you could follow for that, but there are specific things you have to do. And one of them, like I said before, which is here, um, you have to have a city inspector for most conditions. Um, you have to have an you have to have proof that the city came out and inspected what your um, what the repair issue is. And honestly, if they don't, if it doesn't rise to the level of the city doing a citation to the landlord for the issue, um, you're not going to meet that step. And for them to do a citation, it has to be something really, really bad, like something that isn't within code or something that is. Um, you know, a severe violation of a uh, building code for the city or um, some kind of like really extreme health issue. And, you know, most of the day to day repair issues that people have with rentals don't rise to that level. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is um, the eviction process. Um, so just this is a really quick overview on this slide. Um, there's a landlord tenant relationship that exists. Um, the ten there's been a breach of the lease. So um, most commonly evictions are because of non-payment of rent um, or because a tenant paid late or made a partial payment. Um, there are other breaches that could lead to eviction. Like if you cause some very extreme like nuisance issue um, at the apartment that could be grounds for eviction if there's something in your lease regarding um, their nuisance policies or, you know, if you um, violated one of those provisions or some, some rule that they have in the lease, they could evict you for breaching that or violating that rule. Um, so the notice, a notice to vacate is delivered to the tenant. Um, the tenant doesn't move, so the landlord files an eviction in court with the JP court, Justice of the Peace Court, um, and then there's a hearing and writ of possession and appeal. And I'm going to go, this is just a really quick overview, I'm going to go over each of these steps. Um, so first is the notice to vacate. So typically that's going to be a notice that they give you that is a three-day notice to vacate. Um, so this is required before they can file an eviction in court. So the notice to vacate is not from the court. The notice to vacate is from the housing provider. So it's just a simple one sheet of paper that says, you know, you're being asked to vacate the unit within three days. And three days is the typical amount of time. Um, so this notice has to be delivered to someone in the household that's at least 15 years old or can be mailed certified. Um, it could also be placed inside of the door of your apartment so they can enter your apartment and put it on the inside of the door. They could put it on the outside of the door, but typically that's only if a dangerous situation exists. And if they do that, the notice has to be in an envelope with the tenant's name and address, and they also have to mail a certified copy um, 
they have to mail you a copy at, on this at the same time. So notice outside of the door also has to be mailed. Um, so if one of these things is not met, that could be a defense to an eviction in court. So once that three day notice expires, then the housing provider can go file an eviction in court with the Justice of the Peace Court. And they'll file in the jurisdiction where the property is located. Um, and there's things the court filing must have on it. Um, address and apartment number, a uh, description of the facts of the eviction, which becomes really important if it's for something other than non-payment of rent. Um, the total amount of rent due, if the eviction is based on non-payment, has to be in that filing. Um, if the landlord is seeking attorney's fees, that also has to be in the filing. And all the adults who are in the apartment must be served. So this is an and example of what a uh, notice from the court will look like once an eviction has been filed in the court. When you get served, it will look something like this. So this is a document from the court, okay? Which is really different from a lot of times people call us and say, I'm being evicted. And what they've only gotten so far is a notice the, from the apartment for three days to move. Um, so, you know, if, you can't resolve this issue with your housing provider. If you move within those three days, they should not be giving you a court eviction. And you wanna avoid an eviction in court if you can, because an eviction that is not determined in your favor will follow you. It'll go on your record and it'll follow you and it'll be hard for you to rent in the future. Um, so, you know, it all, you know, try to avoid eviction if you can. And Francis, really quickly, can they email these notices to the tenant? Email? Not, mm -hmm. no. They have to give you, they have to serve it. Um, they have to serve it to you in one of these ways right here. Okay. Now, the three-day notice to vacate that is the one given to you by the management of the rental, right? Or the apartment. Typically that needs to be, that needs to be given to you in, in, in a paper form as well. Um, if there's a way that they can show that they delivered it to you, that's on them to show in court. But, um, you know, typically that needs to be given to you on a piece of paper that you're being asked to move. And there's another question related to, are there any resources for renters who have been affected by squatters or stash houses? Can you further explain what do you mean by affected by squatters? Do you mean the squatters themselves or, and if you could just uh, clarify that in the chat, you can message me directly if you'd like, and then we'll, uh, we'll address that. Okay, so after you get this paper from the court, it will tell you on that piece of paper when you're having your court date. Um, I think they might still be doing those hearings via Zoom or online. I'm not sure though, if, I don't know that they've gone back to doing them in person. So, um, but at any rate, however it's scheduled in whatever format it's scheduled, um, it's usually gonna be, between 10 and 21 days after you get that piece of paper from the court. Um, so you have the right to file an answer, which is your response to what the eviction is saying you did. Um, and you gotta make sure that you do not miss your hearing date because um, one, if you miss your hearing date, there's gonna be an automatic judgment in favor of the housing provider. Um, and number two, the hearing is your chance to tell your story. So, um, you know, you can explain how you got into this situation um, and try to convince the judge to make a determination in your favor. Um, so with this being said, if your eviction is for non-payment of rent, um, we recommend that you try, if you can, to gather the funds 
to pay whatever you owe. And when you have your hearing with the judge, tell them that. Yes, I got behind on my rent. Maybe you lost your job, but then found a new one. And, or now, you know, you know, you can pay your rent moving forward and you borrowed money from a friend or family member, which you have with you on that day. And you can make good on paying what you owe the apartment or the rental or the housing provider. Um, and, you know, that might work. The judge might have you pay that and you could continue living there. That's no guarantee that that will happen, but, you know, that's really the only way that you can address a non-payment of rent issue is to come to court ready to pay what you owe. And even in that case, the judge may not care because, you know, I don't want to give you any false hope. Um, the judges in Texas are very pro-landlord, um, but that's, you know, the only way that you could avoid the eviction is to come ready to pay what you owe. Um, so if your eviction is for something other than non-payment of rent, you need to come prepared to tell the judge what happened and why you should not be evicted for that reason. And again, you know, make sure you tell your story, but there's no guarantee that the judge is going to see it your way and you still might lose, but, you know, be prepared to bring your side of what happened in front of the judge. And then can you just uh, can you just reiterate, because there's a couple of questions around this, if the tenant moves out before the notice to vacate, if they move out before the three days, can an eviction still be filed? You know, it should not be filed. If you move out within the three days, they don't have any, you know, the three day notice is to give up the unit, which you've done. So they probably, if they, they won't file an eviction, what they could do is um, if you owe them money, they could, they could make a claim in court for unpaid rent, or they could just report you to a collections agency for what you owe them. Um, but typically it won't be an eviction if you move out within the three days. Um, you know, but that's honestly really difficult for people to do in many cases to move out in three days. So you know, but if you're able to do that, do it because you'll avoid an eviction. You're still going to have an issue of, you know, owing the apartment money. But maybe you can, you know, negotiate with them or do a payment plan or something for what you owe them. So there are some defenses to an eviction. Um, I had mentioned earlier that there's requirements for how they have to serve the three-day notice. Um, and if they don't do that or say they never gave you a three-day notice, um, that could be a reason, that would be something you'd want to tell the judge, and that could be a reason that the whole case gets dismissed if they never gave you a three-day notice, for example. Um, failure to comply with contractual or other notice requirements. So, like I said, no notice to vacate was given, uh, notice was improper. Like, say they delivered the notice to your eight-year-old child, you know, the law says it has to be somebody 15 or older in the household and your eight-year-old child took the notice and just, you know, used it as like drawing paper and then tossed it in the trash and you never know about it. So that might be a reason that a judge would dismiss the case. Um, another reason that, uh, another defense is if you are in a housing choice voucher and the housing provider did everything with the tenant but never informed the housing authority about what was happening. Um, you know, failure to wait three days before filing, like say they gave you the three day notice, but then on day two, they filed the eviction. They can't do that. They need to wait three days. And when I say they can't do that, they'll do it anyway, but you have to raise it as a defense in order for um, the judge to know what happened and to dismiss the case. Um, a defense could be retaliation. So say they're just trying to evict you because you brought to their attention all these repair issues with the apartment. Um, but retaliation is a really difficult thing to prove. So this is where documentation becomes really important. If you feel that you're being evicted because of retaliation, you need to be prepared to present all of your evidence in court um, during the eviction. And then another possible defense, payment of rent. Like I said, you can 
gather up, you know, try to gather up the funds that you owe and come to court ready to pay what you owe the housing provider. And just another quick question from the chat. Um, how can you check on your rental history? Where do landlords go to look? Uh, it's a very complicated question because so many different housing providers use so many different companies, use so many different algorithms um, to, to do those rental history checks. So it's not, it's not really a situation where you can, where like with your credit score, you can go to Experian and get an idea of what your credit score is. It's really not, uh, it's really not like that. Different housing providers look for different things, but Francis, if you could speak a little bit to um, how maybe tenants can anticipate what their rental history looks like um, or how they can protect well, themselves. Okay, there isn't, there isn't one source, for example, or one company that keeps track of everyone's rental history per se. When an apartment says they're gonna check your rental history, they're one, looking for evictions. Those are the easiest to find because evictions will show up on your, those may show up on your credit history. There's also um, databases that housing providers can screen you through that show evictions. And again, it's because evictions are determinations made in court. And so those things are easy to find. But when we're talking about your rental history in general, you know, unless you have an eviction or you have a collection that is because of a past rental situation, um, the only rental history they'll be able to verify is if they actually call your previous landlords. Um, so, you know, it's not like there's something, there's some database out there that keeps track of what your tenancy looked like at each place you rented. Um, really what they're looking for is the only thing they can find on databases is evictions, collections, and those two things. Um, and collections will show up on your credit history and evictions probably will too, but there's also, you know, they can look through, um, there's uh, companies that will search for evictions under your name. Um, but just for general rental history, they're going to call ref references, which means they're going to ask you for your last place you rented, and they're probably, they might call them and ask them things, but really what apartments should only be verifying when they get called is your rental payment history, like did you pay your rent every month and was it on time, and how long you lived there. Right. Okay, and, and they shouldn't be giving commentary on what they think, how they think you were as a tenant, those things are not, they're not supposed to do that. And it could cause them liability to do that as well. Right. And then just to clarify, when we say evictions, we mean like evictions that were actually upheld. If you're looking for evictions that were just filed, then that would come another way. Uh, they would either have to, in most places don't do this, but they would either have to search court records for whatever jurisdiction you lived in to see if there was something even filed or if they were to call your last apartment complex and ask for your rental payment history, then uh, evictions that have been filed might get disclosed. But when we say evictions and collection history, we mean evictions that have actually been upheld in court, not just evictions filed. Just wanted to make that a uh, point of clarification. Oh, good. Yes, because it's only evictions that have actually been made, a determination has been made by a judge. Um, and it's not in your favor, that's gonna go on your record somewhere. Um, but say you got the eviction dismissed, that shouldn't go on your record, so. Okay, so after um, there's a judgment on the eviction, um, you do have the right to appeal and either party can appeal. Um, if the tenant is appealing, they have to file a bond or make a cash deposit with the court or file a statement that they're unable to, to do that. Um, so if the eviction was based on non-payment of rent, the tenant has to pay one month of rent into the court registry within five days of filing the appeal. Um, and so the window for filing an appeal is very short. Um, and if you do file that appeal, what happens is the case gets bumped to the next higher court, which it was in the JP court, or Justice of the Peace court, it's going to get bumped up to the county court for another review so that a new judge is going to rehear the case. Um, if there's no appeal filed by either side, um, the landlord can get a constable's order 
um, on the sixth day after the judgment to remove the tenant. So that's the only time a tenant can be lawfully removed from their unit. So, you know, if you get a housing provider threatening to kick you out or throw all your belongings onto the curb, when they give you a three day notice to vacate, for example, that they can't do that. The only time you can physically be removed from a rental is if a constable comes to take you out of that apartment and the constable won't come without a court order. So after um, the eviction has been determined and it's against the tenant, then six after six days pass or on the sixth day after that, then the housing provider has to go back to the court and ask the judge for an order for the constable to remove the person. Okay, and you know, so how to avoid an eviction, you know, talk to your landlord, um, put, make sure you put stuff in writing, anything that happens at your apartment, any kind of repair request, any, you know, issue with the apartment management that you've had. Um, even if you're only keeping like a timeline journal for yourself of incidents, that's all going to be important if you end up in court. Um, so always keep documents that show that you, that proof to show that you've paid your rent. Um, and if you end up getting an eviction filed against you, um, you could call us, the North Texas Fair Housing Center, and we can give you information about what steps to take, but we don't represent people in eviction hearings. Um, you would contact the um, legal aid that is in your, that provides service in your area. Um, and a lot of times they even have clinics that you can go to and they'll help you file an answer to your eviction and they'll walk you through everything. Um, and they're the experts on eviction. This is what legal aids do every, that's one of their main, that's one of the main services that they provide as legal aid is help with evictions. So um, they're the experts on evictions and you know, if you get stuck in an eviction and you're not sure what to do, call us, we'll tell you the steps, but we'll also probably refer you to legal aid because they might be able to provide you with legal representation. You want to take that one? Oh, all righty. So which of the following is not a valid reason for eviction? There may be more than one answer. Which of the following is not a valid reason for eviction? Non-payment of rent, violation of a non-smoking clause in a lease, tenant asking for a reasonable accommodation, or do the tenant allows someone else to move in? Okay. We're getting a lot of C. Someone also said B. Okay, so A, non-payment of rent is a valid reason for eviction, obviously. Violation of a non-smoking clause in the lease. So again, the lease violations are something to, to be taken seriously, even if it's something that seems not very serious to the tenant. If it is a violation of the lease, even if it's something as simple as what you do with your trash, if it is a violation of some sort of clause in your lease, then you can be brought to brought to eviction court for that. C, a tenant asked for a reasonable accommodation. That is not a valid reason for eviction. It's a violate, that is in fact a violation of that tenant's fair housing rights in that scenario. And then D, the tenant allows someone else to move in. This is a bit of a trick question, but the answer is it's not a valid reason for eviction unless it violates some other part of the lease. If you allow someone else to move in and they go through the proper steps, they go through a background check or whatever is necessary as indicated in the lease, then it is fine. Um, so it's not necessarily a valid reason for eviction just because a tenant has allowed someone else to move in. It might be part of a reasonable accommodation uh, to have a live-in aid, or it might be all any kinds of reasons, but that's not necessarily automatically a valid reason for eviction. All right. And what is the first step in the eviction process? 
What is the first step in the eviction process? Landlord files the eviction in court. A landlord warns the tenant that they may be evicted. C, tenant receives a court date. Or D, a tenant receives a notice to vacate. What is the first step in the eviction process? So I see mostly Ds, a couple Bs in here, but mostly Ds and that's correct. Uh, once a landlord files in court, that means that the other three things have already happened. Now B, landlord warning a tenant that they may be evicted, that does not constitute a step in the eviction process. In certain situations, it may be considered a courtesy, but it is not a formal step in the eviction process. See a court date. That is actually the last step in the eviction process is once the once the tenant receives a or once the tenant shows up for the court date. That is actually the, the last step. D, the tenant receives a notice to vacate. Yes, this is typically the first step in the eviction process, whether it's three days or 30 days, depending on what is outlined in that lease. The notice to vacate simply says, if you are still here at the end of this outline period, then we will move to seek possession of that unit. So that's all that the notice to vacate is. Um, so I get, you know, we get panic calls a lot that where people think, oh, I have to be out of here in 30 days because I got this notice to vacate and, you know, they, they want to appeal even the reason for eviction. So the notice to vacate does not mean that you have to be gone in 30 days. It just means in 30 days, if you're still there, then they will move forward with the eviction process. Okay, so, you know, I have mentioned a couple of times during this presentation that Texas is a very pro-landlord state. Um, judges tend to be more pro-landlord than supportive of tenants. So what can we all do about this? Um, the first thing, stand up to your landlord when your rights are being violated. Um, but also it all, you know, it all comes down to who is in the state legislature and who can propose new laws that are protective of tenants. Um, you know, right now, uh, the majority of the legislature is not really um, too concerned with tenants' rights. Um, and there's also a really strong apartment lobby with the Apartment Association. And so, you know, it's not that laws that are protective of tenants aren't uh, proposed, it's that those laws never even make it out of, those proposed laws never even make it out of committee and get voted on because they're, you know, kind of, I don't know, snubbed out before they can even progress. And so what we need is more legislatures who care about those issues. And that comes down to voting and who you're voting for. And are you voting for folks that, that care about those issues, that care about tenants' rights? Um, and of course, vote, you know, if you have uh, the right to vote, vote, because it makes, it can make a difference. Um, and then I guess before we hand it over to you, Marty, for the CEU stuff, um, were there any outstanding questions, Camille, that we should address? Yes, we have actually quite a few. Um, so we'll try to, to go ahead and, and move through these. So the first, can you talk a little bit about subleasing. Is it every tenant's right or is it something that people should be looking out for in the lease? And um, what if someone try maybe tries to get evicted for, sublease okay. for subletting? So most times, whether or not you can sublease is going to be in your lease document. It's almost always a term in your lease document where it tells you whether you can or cannot sublease to someone else. Um, and so that's the first place to look is if you have a lease document, look at the provisions because um, more likely than not, there's going to be a provision in there. And most times that provision says you cannot sublease. Um, so if there isn't an, if there isn't um, an explanation or if there isn't a term regarding subleasing in your lease, then you need to work that out with your housing provider whether or not that's going to be okay. And if they say it is okay, get that in writing. So if you do sublease, you have proof that your housing provider said it was okay to do that. 
Um, but all, you know, leases that I've reviewed lately, or at least in the last couple of years, they all have subleasing provisions and all of those provisions say that you cannot sublet. Right. Okay. And next, uh, can we speak to the idea? So I guess the question kind of revolves around if you have someone who is staying in a particular unit, maybe it's a senior unit, or they're staying somewhere and they've been on a wait list for affordable housing, or they've been on a wait list for senior housing, and their name comes up and they want to act on that, but they are in a lease. Uh, can you speak to, do you have any advice for someone in that situation, given how we've talked about the only real legal ways to break a lease here in Texas. Yeah. So, you know, that is not a legal reason to break your lease. So if you are in a lease and you get offered an affordable unit, you need to right away try to start negotiating with your housing provider to let you out of your lease without any fees or penalties. Okay, so the only way you're gonna be able to break your lease in that situation is one, if the housing provider agrees that it's okay, they're still probably gonna ask you to give at least 30 day notice, maybe even 60 days. So you need to make sure that you keep that in mind. And if they do say it's okay to break your lease, get it in writing, make sure that you have proof that they said it was okay. Because we get people calling us all the time that said, you know, I left my last apartment. I told the manager I was moving out early. She said that was okay. And then, you know, eight months later, they check the credit report and they have a collections on their unpaid debt from their apartment that was put on there because they, you know, they charged them essentially for the rest of their lease. Um, so you always want to get in writing if the housing provider says it's okay. But really, you have to negotiate your way out of that lease. And, you know, they may not let you out, but leases always have a term in them that has a, a set fee or penalty. If you want to break your lease early, there's typically um, a fee of at least one month's rent. And then there's also a reletting fee, which, you know, can range. I mean, I've seen reletting fees of $150 and I just saw one the other day that was like over $1,000 for a reletting fee. Plus on top of, you know, a month's rent. So, you know, that may be the only way that they'll let you out. I mean, you know, you really have to negotiate with them. And, you know, we do have an advocacy program here so we can contact the housing provider and try to negotiate for you to try to get you out of that lease. But, you know, we don't have any kind of, um, we don't have any law behind us that helps us with that, with breaking the lease in that situation, unfortunately. Okay. And so for people who may be living month to month or may be living without a lease for whatever reason, is, uh, what, is there anything that you recommend as proof that they have been living there month to month? Is, is getting a receipt that says, you know, this is for rent at this address from this day to this day? Like, what do you recommend someone who doesn't have a written lease if at one point they want to exercise their rights either in court or some other way? Okay. Um, where they can have proof that they've been there month to month on a particular agreement? Um, well, typically, you're not going to get a month to month until after you've met the term of a lease. And so you're always going to, you should always have a lease document to look back on and make sure you never throw that away because that's going to be your proof that, hey, I, I stayed here these 12 months on this lease and then I went month to month. And there's really, you know, the only way you know, and then if you give your 3D notice, for example, because you want to move out, the housing provider isn't going to be able to do anything about it unless they can produce another lease that you signed. So it's not a matter of you proving your month to month. It's really a matter of, can you know, is the housing provider going to be able to produce another lease that you signed? And they shouldn't if you're month to month, right? So. Right. And do you have any recommendations, like let's say a person is um, is undocumented and they have been living somewhere without a lease, uh, is there anything that you recommend that they do moving forward? Um, well, like I said, you can, they can always ask for a lease. I mean, it's not, there's no law that says, you know, documentation status has a bearing on whether you can sign a contract. So you could sign a lease, but if the housing provider won't give you a lease, I would just say have, you know, keep receipts of everything. Receipts of the rental payments. Um, if you've had repair requests, keep copies of those requests that you've made. 
any notices you've gotten from the apartment, keep those on file, like just have, you know, a, a file of everything that is related to your rental so that you have that in case you need it. Yeah. And this would be a good space for, for advocacy because I know there is a little bit of a hesitation on behalf of those particular tenants to, to ask for that lease, um, but, that, but this, is, this is a space um, to advocate um, for, those, uh, for those people if they may be a little bit no. hesitant. Camille, let me, if, if I could, I, I, we're at 25 after. What I'd like to do is go over the CEUs and talk about the next training. And then if you guys want to stay on, on and answer other questions, that's up to you. I, I just want to, for the people that are on for CEUs, I want to make sure I cover this before we get past the, um, the 1130 hour. Is that all right? Thanks, Marty. Yeah. yeah okay. That's, that's okay. I just want to, to go over one more time this for those of you that are on for CEUs, we're providing uh, complimentary CEUs for those of you that are licensed social workers or LPCs. We are set up in Texas. If you're licensed someplace else, you're more than welcome to go through the process, get the certificate, and but but there's no guarantee their your jurisdiction is going to take it. Um, we also are offering certificates of attendance. Um, the, the process for each of these is the same. Um, it, it's good for, for attending one and a half classroom hours today. Um, you must complete the entire webinar to been on here. Um, and, um, and that means not more than, miss more than about five, 10 minutes at the most. We do get a record from, um, from Zoom um, after the, the fact, and those records are what we have to keep in case we're on it. So um, please know that we're going to hold you to that. You must complete the Google survey. It should pop up when you close out of Zoom. If it doesn't, uh, sometimes um, companies or your computer has a pop-up blocker on it. It will also be sent to you via email tomorrow in a follow-up email. So look for that. Make sure you complete that. That is a requirement. You will have one week to complete the Zoom, um, I'm sorry, the Google survey. And after that, I'm going to ask for two weeks until the 11th to get those certificates out to you because I will be out of town for 10 days. Please give me until the 11th to get them to you before. Uh, it's always interesting. I get emails from people and I almost should put on here that if you email me asking, when am I going to get my certificate before the date? I should automatically use that as a disqualifier because obviously you weren't paying attention on the webinar because I go over it twice. So please wait till after the 11th. If you don't get it by then, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and we'll see what happens. Um, we've had a few people that have had email issues, uh, but we're, we're pretty much on track right now to get them out on time. So um, that's that. And then if we can go to the following screen, I want to remind those that, that came on later, we have a clinic coming up um, next week. This will be very different than the webinars. It is an interactive format. We'll be in the Zoom meeting format. So you will have you will be on camera and you will have your microphone on. Um, obviously, we're going to control that a little bit. We don't want it to get out of control, but it's going to be an interactive clinic about eviction and eviction avo avoidance. So some of the issues we've talked about today, but you're gonna be able to bring to the table maybe real case issues, real things that are going on that you want some advice on or help on. Just note that there's gonna be other people in the room. We're, we, we're not set up to put you into breakout rooms. So everyone's gonna be he hearing what everybody's doing. We're gonna talk about confidentiality as we get started, but it will be an interactive clinic format. This is a trial for us. We're gonna try it for the first time next week and see how it goes. Um, I I'm gonna turn it back over to Francis and Camille for any questions, if they wanna still take them. Uh, for those of you that are getting off, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it greatly. But go ahead, Francis, for as, much, for as long as you have time for, that's up to you. Okay. And really quick, I just want to plug, because we've gotten a couple of questions about reasonable accommodations and modifications, we, uh, we have a training specifically for that. It's coming soon. It's, I'm not sure if it's calendared yet, but that's a, it's, a, uh, it's a topic that requires more time than what we have here today. Um, so, but if you have any questions that are time sensitive, feel free to reach out to us at the North Texas Fair Housing Center 
and you can just speak to me directly. And whether or not it's something I can help you with, if, if I can't, then I can point you in the right direction. Um, and if it's something that I can take on in an advocacy space, then uh, we can work together and move forward on that. So for those kind of those remaining questions, reach out to us directly. I don't know, do we have a slide with our contact information? If we could go back to that and put that up. But for those remaining questions, feel free to give me a call, speak to me personally, and we can um, get set on the good foot from there. And my contact information is not up here, but I am C Brown at North Texas Fair Housing. So she's F. Espinoza at North Texas Fair Housing. I am C. Brown at North Texas Fair Housing. You can use that same phone number and my extension is 302. Were there any questions that we hadn't addressed from the chat, Camille? Um, just, uh, just about modifications and accommodations, but again, that's something that we can handle okay. directly. And one person wants to know if we know anybody who is providing rental assistance. I don't, rental assistance, I'm not sure. Um, it, it, it would very much determine the, the area someone's in. You can, you can email me that information, but it, um, it's very county and, 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 and area specific. It's not, a, there's not anything general that I'm aware of. Um, there was a question, I don't know if you got to it, that asked about smoking. Did you get to that? In, right. In the person's right. case, I don't know, did you, I don't, maybe. maybe no, you know. no, I didn't. No, I didn't, but yeah, you're right. That did come in. The, the, the wow. Somebody was asking, saying that in their lease, it was there was no smoking, but in their apartment, they're smelling smoke from people in adjacent units. Is there anything they can do about that? Because it is a health hazard. Yeah. Um, you know, I would go talk to the manager because if that's a provision in the leases, then they're not enforcing it and they should be. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's no way to force them to enforce that provision, but bring it to their attention that that's what's happening and that you're smelling the smoke. And again, the, there are, I, I have had a couple of cases where if it has affected the person's like asthma or some other existing disability, then we've, you know, I've been able to kind of successfully be able to work with that provision with, to work with it as an accommodation uh, for a person with disability as the smoke might exacerbate certain existing conditions. And I've been successful in that in a couple of cases. So, you know, outside of, outside of something like that, then, you know, you're, your best recourse maybe to just go ahead and and move when you get the opportunity yeah, Sheree, to have you, Sheree, you might want to reach out to um, Camille. She mm -hmm, right, Sheree, yeah, I'm looking at you in the chat. Go ahead and go ahead and reach out to me. Um, and this may be something that we can that we can work on with that particular management company. Um, if the but in the meantime, get get some sort of documentation for that particular disability if we're going to go that route. Do, uh, can I ask you also one thing real quick? Is um, do, we talked about the Texas Tenants Union. Are they doing anything about? Um, uh, and I, I know we've talked about this before, and I don't remember the answer about kind of pulling tenants together to uh, to to give them um, kind of advocates or um, training on lobbying for themselves or advocating for themselves as far as the state legislature goes. You know, I know Texas Tenants Union, they themselves do lobbying in Austin when the legislature's in, but I don't know if they have a training for um, their constituents on how to do that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sh Cherie's on. Um, Cherie, do you know? Do you guys? Cherie says she's with the Texas Tenants Union. I don't know if, if you guys have. I, I would think that that would be the, the place for it, but, but boy, you all got to advocate for yourself. You've got to understand you're up against the Apartment Association, which is a very powerful um, lobbying force because they have money. You know, money talks, unfortunately, um, but you still got to make your voices heard by the people that, that represent you in Austin. You really got to make your um, make your voices heard. And... Um, um, and see what you can do to help to help balance 
the law a little bit so it's not so lopsided towards landlords. It is very lopsided in Texas. And that is definitely um, an issue that needs to be balanced out some, um, at the least. But it doesn't get done if you just think that someone else is going to do is doing it. You've got to, everybody's got to sit down and spend a little time um, working on that. Right. And it looks like that's it from the chat, unless Marty, you caught something I didn't. But that looks like that's it for the, from the chat. And again, if you have any burning questions where we are available to speak with you offline and to maybe pick that, pick up something in the advocacy, advocacy space if you're calling about a very specific case or a situation. Great. Um, um, Mahalia, I'm not sure what you're, who you're speaking to to reach out to you, but um, but I, I saw you put your email address in there. I, I, I read it. I wasn't sure who you're um, who you're asking to to reach out to you. So you might want to clarify that. Uh, very good. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Wonderful, Camille. Are you good? Yes. Good to very go. Good. Once again, once again, Francis and Camille, thank you so much. Um, we certainly appreciate this. You guys were set to do this on a monthly basis for an hour and a half. Um, we're going to be expanding on topics we talked about last month to give you more time and more in-depth information. And if the clinic is successful, we plan on doing that each month as well. So, um, so please look look out for 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 next month, and and please. Um, give the information about the clinic to anybody that you know that it might be helpful to because um, that, that's kind of a, a new thing for us and we're hoping it, it can really help people. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and you all have a blessed day.